Coming up on Theater Talk. I can promise you there isn't a book on horror that has more about theater in it than this book, Shock Value. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> these guys, when I would interview these horror guys, you know, they, they've been interviewed many times, but they'd be like, why is he asking us about Pinter? And <laughs> and stuff? Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm the show's producer, Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riddle of the New York Post. And we're already laughing, Susan, because we have one of our favorite guests on. He's been on many times. He always makes us laugh. The great, great playwright Douglas Carter Bean, back on Theater Talk for I don't know how many appearances you've made here, Douglas. I get the tote bag this time. You get the tote bag. And Douglas is here because he has a terrific new musical about to open on Broadway called Lysistrata Jones. A wonderful, wonderful musical. And he's brought uh, with us someone that I'm going to let you introduce to our viewers, Douglas. Well, this is my writer. I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> 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 yeah, what's his name? Yeah, yeah I, 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 it's on your, it's on your clipboard. Uh, 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 right, uh, Lewis Finn. No. <laughs> no, no, we're kidding. This is my, this is my partner, uh, Lewis Flynn, who is my partner in life and also my partner in com in uh, writing the show. Who has or written Broadway. the uh, uh, music, music lyrics, orchestration, and or a, and what does that mean? You you've done Douglas. I basically I do the gazinda. <laughs> I do what goes into the next number. <laughs> now, is this the first time you guys have ever uh, worked together? We actually uh, met uh, Mark Brokaw. I had written a play called Music from a Sparkling Planet, mm -hmm. and I had written it to go with a certain composer's music. And uh, Mark Brokaw came on as director and said, I have a composer I'd like to bring onto the project, and it was this one. And I was furious. I hated him the moment I met him. <laughs> and, <laughs> well, I, I hit it well. I was professional. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, then, and then that show ran its course. And when it was done, <laughs> as we say politely, and then I met Lewis at a cocktail party afterwards, and we hit it off, and we've been together. So you guys, was there actual creative tension between the two of you and the musical you first worked on that went off the rails? I'm asking you. No, Lewis. as soon as he heard my score. Oh, I love. <laughs> it wasn't. A, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't a, a musical. It was a play with music. And then Lewis also did the music for A Little Dog Laughed. Right now, how does it work though, guys? When you're, your partners in life and you're writing together, what happens if he writes a song that, you don't like very much? How do you tell him? Well, it's usually the other way around. <laughs> 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 just tell us, Lewis. Right? You don't like. What do you say? No, we just talk about it, work it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean it is a it's a it's a com there is there is a there is I know Michael, grown ups respect each other. That's how it works in the real world. With grown ups. <laughs> hide the bruises. But so but I mean you guys have the same voice and tone. Do you I mean Douglas has a very distinctive sense of humor and you kind of write in the musical idiom that matches his wacky take on the world? We talk about different numbers, and I'll go and write the song. And discovering the tone of the piece is the challenge from the beginning to make sure it sort of matches up with the dialogue and the, the wittiness of it all. Uh, and, you know, it's sort of like this. We start and what ends up going through the filter of our endless conversations is what... Tell us about Lysistrata Jones for people who haven't seen it. Or, or know how to pronounce it. <laughs> ah, well, we were going to get to that. Something Michael to Musto said on this Lysistra show. It's Lysistra Jones. No, it's not. It's, Michael Musto has, went to a very pretentious secondary school. <laughs> if, you actually, if you actually go on, I know, he was bragging. I went to secondary school. No, I no, 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 I love him. Lysistra I love him. Jones. No, it's, it, in the, the English pronunciation is Lysistra. Lysistra. Yes, and then the American pronunciation, uh, pronunciation is Lysistrata. Yeah, that's how I pronounce um, it. Lysistrata. It's with the, the, the real people. <laughs> uh, so tell us about uh, Lysistrata Jones because it's a take on the great Aristotle. It is. It's like. sort of taking the the basic premise. I mean, I I'd wanted. I was looking for a classic story that I could do a real contemporary take on, because musicals that I really love have done that in the '30s and. Uh, especially the Rogers and Hart. Yeah, the boys stuff. from Syracuse. Exactly right. Yeah. That's those sort. I always loved them, and I said, "Wouldn't it be great to find a story?" And then Lysistrata was like, "Oh, what if I turned it into some kind of sport and cheerleaders?" And that was sort of funny. That sort of made me laugh a little bit. And then I said, "Lysistrata Jones doing kind of a bit on Carmen Jones or Cleopatra Jones." And I said, "Well, now that's funny. That makes you good." Mm -hmm. And so I I showed it to Lewis, and he had written some pop songs I listened to, and really. Loved, and we started working on it together. And we did a reading 
long time ago. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Matter of fact, everyone who was in it is now so old. They couldn't <laughs> they do it. We finally did the show. <laughs> but it was like, what if she's a house mother at the sorority? <laughs> I like I, know. Was, uh, I know, because Marion Seldes was the lead originally. <laughs> she was. Uh, we, used, we used her dad's translation. <laughs> <laughs> For those who are unfamiliar with the uh, Aristophanes canon, uh, Lysistrata <laughs> is about uh, women who decide to withhold sex from their husbands. Now you know until, about that, Michael. Until they stop <laughs> the war. Okay. What hap what's your take on this? What are they, what are, what, why are they withholding it, sex from their husbands? Well, I, I, I like Penn and Teller. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Without the tricks. <laughs> Without the rope trick. Um, so the deal is, uh, the, the, it's the worst basketball uh, in college, worst college basketball team in the world, haven't won a game in 33 years, uh, tying in with the Peloponnesian 33-year <laughs> war. Um, and it's Athens University. Georgia. <laughs> no, no, it's actually, at, it's actually, it would be upstate New York because they play Ithaca and Syracuse. Uh, so, and, then, and I just thought a college setting was great, and so it was, uh, the girls won't put out to the boys uh, win a basketball game. Simple Adult. as that. What is, the, what is the style of music that you're, you're working in for this? Um, I'm trying to be as contemporary and radio ready as possible. My influences, my first show I ever saw was Dreamgirls, and I loved hearing songs on the radio, and the, it just sounded so present. And when we start, first started talking about this, we wanted to do something that sounded of the day. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of the songs reference, well, orchestrationally, you know, orchestrationally, it's a band, it's a real band on stage with. We have two backup singers up there. Um, it's very influenced from Katy Perry to Lady Gaga. Um, so really up to the minute music. Trying to be, yeah. yeah. But what's In great the is, that, is that, that Lewis is, you know, a, a Princeton trained composer and he has musical, he knows how to do a musical theater song. There's a beginning, middle, and an end. Right. It's not like a sort of a jukebox music where you go in and they start saying, let's hear it for the boy. Yeah. And after nine <laughs> minutes, you know that they're hearing it for the boy. <laughs> They implore you. No, really. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting you say that because I always thought the, the genius of Jonathan Larson's score for Rent mm -hmm. is that it is really, they're musical theater songs disguised as rock songs. Right. right. And it's a very tricky thing to pull off because you hear a lot of, you know, contemporary composers who come into this business uh, and they just can't write in the musical theater style that a song has to be in. Well, the trick, in most pop songs, you're sitting in one emotion for three minutes. It's really very Baroque. You right. are happy or you are sad, and the choruses repeat, and it's all about the sustaining the, the groove of hey, song yeah. for three and a half minutes. And Jerry. in musical theater, you know, you really have to have a journey. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> we have to let the viewers in on that. Susan and I have banned the word journey from the show because too many actors come on and, and have say them. journey. And <laughs> Douglas thinks we should have a, a drinking game when they oh. come on to say Journey. Everyone has to know, take a sip. Right. Very <laughs> sly. Very Everybody, <laughs> Journey. Cheers, Journey. Every, you have to start, every verse has to have new information. Every chorus has to reveal something new. Right. And that's what makes it theatrical. Right. Now, um, I have often been told by uh, book writer friends of mine, Douglas, mm -hmm. that you have the most thankless job in the musical theater. Mm -hmm. Not the way I do it. <laughs> <laughs> Man <laughs> prays 24-7. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> because as Harvey Firestein once showed me the first draft of La Cage aux Faux, yeah. he wrote a speech mm -hmm. for Zaza mm -hmm. about, I am not going to hide who I am anymore. Yeah. It was a beautiful speech. And the last bit was, I am what I am. Yeah. And little old Jerry Herman said, oh, that's good. Took the whole speech, turned it into a huge hit song of which Harvey never got any money that flowed in from all of the recordings of it. I, I don't, I don't, but I, we live together, so maybe know, some, maybe really. he'll buy me a hat or something. Uh, <laughs> the wills will take it. But I mean, this, the wills will take it. But, but this is what you got to do, you write a scene, and if he's it got is. a song, and, it's going to become a song. And you have to learn to love that and embrace it and know it's part of the process. Right. I have no ego that way because I write plays. Right. That I can go and just say, like, underscore it. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that underscoring's too loud. <laughs> you know? Well, I'm, I'm thrilled, actually, though. It is a, 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 an original... American musical comedy, mm -hmm. and now you're on Broadway. And here, yeah, good luck. Incredible. Boys. It's a tough, it's a tough world. You know that, Douglas. I know it's a tough world, but I think that it's a good show. Yeah. And I think, and I always people say, "Who's your star?" And I said, "What was the name of the star in Book of Mormon?" Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that if the show is good, yeah, that's the star. If the that's the star. That's the star. If if you guys win a Tony Award, uh, who's gonna speak first? You or Aristophanes? <laughs> Aristophanes. <laughs>
Well, I don't think Aristophanes will have a chance. From <laughs> 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 my experience. <laughs> <laughs> well said. All right, Douglas Carter Bean, and your name again, sir? Lewis. L <laughs> Lewis Flynn, Flynn, the composer, lyricist, orchestrator of the terrific new musical Lysistrata Jones with a book by Douglas Carter Bean. It's great fun, guys. Good luck with the show. Thank, Thank you. you. Susan, we're going to take a break from uh, all the horrors we have to suffer through on Broadway most of the time <laughs> to talk about some actually interesting scary things. Uh, we're going to talk about horror movies today with our good friend Jason Zinneman, who is the one of the drama critics at the New York Times. And he's got a terrific new book out called Shock Value, How a Few Eccentric Outsiders Gave Us Nightmares, Conquered Hollywood, and Invented Modern Horror. Welcome, Jason, to Theater Talk. Great to be here. All right. Um, what is, in your mind the most important horror movie of the last 25 years, the seminal one. That, I'll uh, say the last 40 years. Last 40 years? Right. I would say the most important one, it's either gotta be Texas Chainsaw Massacre or Halloween or Alien. The question is, is it, there's a couple questions. The, what's the scariest horror film? Or what's the, most, what's the best horror film? Or what's or your question? What's the most important? In terms of influence, Halloween is probably the most ripped off movie it's one of the most ripped off movies of all time. Fair John forward. Carpenter's great movie where the Michael Myers and all that kind of that stuff. That Michael Myers character has been, has been imitated constantly. You see it in everything from movies, uh, horror movies to like No Country for Old Men, you know, mainstream movies, to Hillary Clinton's 3 a.m. campaign ad. Uh, <laughs> you, don't, you, don't see, you don't see the Myers character, but you see the, the shaky camera point of view of the killer. Uh, you see everyone rips that movie off, and it basically spawned the slasher boom of the 80s. But, but what's fascinating about Halloween, because uh, it's one of my favorite movies, and I watch it around the Halloween time. It's on AMC, round the clock. But what is so fascinating about it is that the pace of that movie is stately compared to what horror movies now. That build for, I mean, just the girls walking home from school, the car follows them, Michael Myers just appears behind a bush. It moves at such a stately, creepy pace. And now everything is the slasher fast, fast, fast. Well, well, what happened there? It's, it's really true. It's true of the whole decade. I mean, if you look at Alien, Alien is an incredibly slow, it starts incredibly slow. Yeah. Texas Chainsaw Massacre also, I mean, one of the wonderful things Texas Chainsaw Massacre is it starts very fast, and then at the end of the movie, when they really have you in your hands, the movie stops and becomes a one-act play. Uh, and, you know, I mean, this is true of all movies. Editing has sped up. It's become all about the quick shock. It's become about what you can, what monsters you can show as opposed to what you don't see. I mean, right. in a lot of these movies, people think that they're really bloody and really gory, right. but when you actually watch them closely, I mean, Halloween certainly, but even Texas Chainsaw mm -hmm. Massacre, which the title alone evokes gore, right? right. Actually has very little blood. Um, and you know, the, what I write about in the book is that a lot of these directors are trying to answer this thing which I call the monster problem. And the monster problem essentially is, uh, every horror audience wants the same thing, which is to see the monster. The mm -hmm. problem is, is that when they do see it, it's an anticlimax. Mm -hmm. right. So how do you get around that problem? Well, one way in Halloween is to, or, you know, is to keep the monster off screen. Another way, you know, you look at Michael Myers, he's this incredible, exactly, he's, he has no psychology, no backstory. He's this very weird experimental character in the middle of an otherwise realistic suburban every town. And an easy monster to create, you point out. Michael Myers was not a big special effect. Well, one of the things I love about the genre is you see how uh, basically a lack of money, yes. right? Like, <laughs> makes it better. <laughs> makes it better. Basically, how, how I think the story of modern horror is the story of how commercial, sometimes crass instincts create art. But look, and look, let's look back to Night of the Living Dead, even before Halloween, back to 1968, how they created the scariest movie I've ever seen with just, what, some innards from a, a yeah, local they, stockyard, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Well, yeah. yeah, they invented the zombie movie, yeah. uh, even though George Romero didn't even call it a zombie uh, at the time. Uh, it, was, uh, it was something totally new, but it was, you know, several things that were trail, trailblazing with them. I mean, one was the gore, yeah. uh, which was fairly unusual. But also, that movie was interpreted at the time as a political statement. You know, it was, they had an African-American hero who fought off all the zombies, and in the la end of the movie, uh, a law enforcement officer guns him down randomly in this act of real bleak violence. And, you know, 
the critics, you know, the French critics, you know, from yeah. du Cinema, they said this is this trenchant commentary on American politics. Although on race I relations say, in America. Though I, I have to say, as a late night viewer at the Waverly Theater, you, I did not interpret it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that, I think, lent, uh, yeah. made people view it also through the prism of race. Now, of course, Romero, you ask him, well, why did you cast this African-American hero, which was unusual? Mm -hmm. um, there's not that many leads, black leads at that time. He said, well, you know, I live in Pittsburgh. There's not that many good actors around here. He was the best guy for the part. Yeah. And, yeah. and it becomes history. a political statement. Although later on you could say with Romero's um, Day of the Dead or Dawn of the Dead, later ones, the one that takes place in the mall. Right. I always thought this is kind of interesting commentary on the consumer culture being consumed in this mall. So maybe later on he begins to put more sort of political messages in. Oh, no question. I mean, the, the interesting story is usually when people talk about uh, playwrights or directors listening to what the audience says, mm -hmm. responding to what the audience wants. They consider it pandering. Well, here's an example of Romero saw the response and he thought to himself, all right, if I'm going to make another zombie movie, it's got to have a political statement. Yeah. So Dawn of the Dead, there, there was no question. He hit you over the head with this political statement and every zombie movie uh, since then has had this strong metaphorical content, which has made it better. So in a way, horror is an interesting genre because the, the filmmakers have a relationship with the audience it's not pandering, and by listening to the audience, they made better movies. Interesting. Now, you call them um, a few eccentric outsiders. What do you mean they were outsiders? Well, it's interesting. I mean, I this book is based in reporting. It's not. Yeah, a, you talk to a lot of the surviving. I talked yeah. to them all, and yeah. my idea was not to to. There's there's criticism in here too, but the heart of it is I went to talk to people who made all these movies, people from the studios, people who acted in them, and. Uh, you know, I tried to figure out like what do they have in common, mm -hmm. and one of the things is they all sort of they they identified as being kind of oddballs, misfits. They had bad relationships with their parents or authority figures. Uh, they saw themselves as these kind of misunderstood, uh, you know, kind of nerds, and they cling to this narrative even when it wasn't true. Uh, and I think you, there's something almost romantic about it. You see it in the appeal of something like Frankenstein, which is like the misunderstood monster in Frankenstein, mm -hmm. and. Um, I think that whether, whether or not they were really outsiders, the fact that they saw themselves that way and that came through in the movies and how you look at some of the monsters, and I think is integral to why these movies are great. The other key thing to understand about these, this period in the late 60s and 70s is horror was an incredibly disreputable genre. John Carpenter said it was barely more reputable than pornography, right? right. That's changed. So everybody you talk to who directed films, Wes Craven, John Carpenter back then, you get a sense they're mildly embarrassed to be in the genre. Today, if you talk to the horror directors who make movies today, they're incredibly proud because they're in the, in the footsteps of Night of the Living Dead, these classic, <laughs> yes, great yes. art films. What was the Hollywood movie, um, I mean, they always say um, Jaws was the thing that created the blockbuster. What was the horror movie that suddenly elevated the genre from being the B-list, the basement area here where you're embarrassed to be working, to suddenly making it uh, uh, a really uh, uh, ex uh, profitable thing that Hollywood studios wanted to do? No question, The Exorcist. The Exorcist. The Exorcist changed everything. Really? Changed everything. Well, The Exorcist, you know, it got you know Academy Award nominations. Right. That Lee J. Cobb, the original uh, Willie yeah. Loman, was in it. Had great actors. Yep. It was also stately. Um, it was beautifully shot. Beautifully shot. Uh, it Fried legitimized the genre, though. It legitimized the genre, and it, it, tellingly, William Friedkin then and now doesn't call it a horror film. He's the only person on earth who doesn't call The Exorcist a horror film because at that time, horror just meant was shorthand for bad. Yeah. But the Exorcist was such a huge hit, and also was, uh, you know, critically respected. Uh, you know, James Baldwin wrote about it, and all this. That um, suddenly the studio started buying up all this horror talent. So people like Toby Hooper, who made Texas Chainsaw Massacre, was got a, con you know, a, a contract and came out to Hollywood. And studios started to see, okay, we can make money on this. Mm. It was the beginning of what you see now, which is that horror isn't some little niche anymore. Yeah. Horror is the meat and potatoes of the business of Hollywood. Nightmare on Elm Street 7, 8, 9, 10. And Last weekend, Paranormal Activity 3 made you know, <laughs> $56 million. Uh, it's uh, the horror, and, and it's not, there's no more horror phase. And, and you know, one of the ideas behind writing this book is that I think to order to understand popular culture today, you can't be like what my parents were like, and they just said, well, we're just not going to pay attention to horror. Mm. If you, you know, I, just in my job writing about theater, I did a story a couple years ago about the influence the horror has on playwrights. Mm. Tra I, when I talked to Tracy Letts, Martin McDonough, Connor McPherson, these guys loved these horror films yeah. from the 70s. They were a huge influence on them. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you, know, you need to, horror is just a, a, a huge part of mainstream culture now. But, but you yeah. say in your book, though, that it was a playwright 
who had a profound influence on horror. No genre. playwright had a greater influence on horror than, than Pinter. Harold Pinter. It's Jason I, I can promise you there isn't a book on horror that has more about theater in it than this book, Shock Value. It's like, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> these guys, when I would interview these horror guys, you know, they, they've they been interviewed many times, but they'd be like, why is he asking us about Pinter? <laughs> and and did, did, they, did they know who Pinter and Beckett were, these guys? Well, that's, that's what I found, which was amazing, which was that, the, because these guys were sort of embarrassed to be in horror, their influences were much more diverse than the people who make movies today. They, a lot of them, like Craven, didn't know much about horror films, but he really loved, you know, he did, he did know about Sartre and Beckett, and most importantly, uh, Pinter comes up again and again. Uh, William Friedkin made the first film adaption of The Birthday Party, which is a right. terrifying play, actually. Yeah. Uh, and he says that, you know, the Pinter's, you know, pause and uh, what is unsaid and the kind of oblique menace right. in, right. in, in the birthday party made its way into The Exorcist. Uh, and I believe it, if you watch it, and not to mention, if you look at who starred in the first Broadway productions of Pinter, mm -hmm. uh, Ian Holm, who was you know, the key figure in uh, Alien, uh, yeah, Donald, right. Donald Pleasance yeah, yeah, in the right. Halloween, uh, Robert Shaw from Jaws, right. there's something, Work, working on Pinter teaches you a lot about horror. Uh, and in a lot of ways, the 60s, which I think is, is not uh, as potent a time for horror, the scariest things out there were Ionesco, Beckett, Pinter. Yeah. You know, when, when he asked you what was the Hollywood legitimizing film, I thought you were going to say Rosemary's Baby. That's and we love, the, we love the 1968 a little before The Exorcist, but we love the fact that it was written by a kind of failed playwright, right. Ira Levin, and that the key plot point was that he sold her soul to... Uh, to get, get apart. apart. <laughs> to get apart. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there is this there is this influence out there. I, I think the Pinter point is very very well taken though because when you see those movies, um, oh god, what's his name? Um, the crazy one who used to no 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 the crazy one who worked in the, the video store who's a big movie maker now. Uh, when Quentin Tarantino. Yeah. When you see Pulp Fiction, you see these guys in these dark suits who you don't really know what they do except they do bad things. I happen to be uh, seen. Maybe it was the birthday party. I forget what Pinter play. And these men come in. And they're wearing dark suits, and you're not quite sure what they do. And I thought that that's that's Tarantino. Oh, the story of the birthday party is two mysterious guys come in to uh, and interrogate uh, this this guy and keep asking him these questions. But it's very hard to figure out what they want. Yeah. But you know they're aggressive, and you know they they mean <laughs> trouble. And they break. I remember because it's actually one of the first ones I ever was scared. Is my my mother directed a production of the birthday party, uh. and when I was a little kid, I saw it, and they broke his glasses. And as a kid who wore glasses, there's nothing worse than yes, breaking your right. glasses. You can't see. It was horrible. And before dragging him out, and you never really know why, what they're after, yeah. and that's what makes it the most scary thing. I mean, one of the themes of my book is I try to look at, you know, what's the scariest thing in the world. And I asked all these guys, what's the scariest thing in the world? And you know, a lot of them cite this one writer, H.P. Lovecraft, who's kind of yeah. the father of literary yeah. horror, and who says that the scariest thing in the world is the fear of the unknown. Right. And that's what you see in that in Birthday Party, is that you never find out what, the fact you don't know what they want right. is what's most scary, and that's what you also see in these movies. In and Michael you see, Myers, and you yeah. see Michael Myers in Halloween, why does he want to kill Jamie Lee, Lee Curtis? Curtis? She has no relationship to right. his past or anything. Why her? And the incredible thing is how frequently the sequels and remakes misunderstand that essential point. Right. Because later on in the Halloween series, they have to series, explain. They what? made Jamie Lee Curtis's character his yeah. sister, yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. but the but the fact that you didn't know is exactly right. what was so terrifying. That's about right. It. That's right. Why Linda Blair? Why this little girl in Georgetown? Why does the devil go into her? Well, well, that's that's interesting. I mean, you know, I look. I, I there's a argument behind the scenes, of The Exorcist, between the director, Friedkin, who wanted to keep it unknown, he wanted to keep it suspenseful, and the writer of the book, William Peter William Blatty, Blatty, who's yeah. a very devout guy and wrote and saw The Exorcist as a religious book. Right. In fact, to, he thought that if you convince people there's a devil, you can make them believe there's a god. And he he had a very firm idea of what why the devil was picking this girl. It was mainly to get at this priest right, uh, right. who was having a crisis of faith. Um, and what, what's interesting, you see this a lot of movies, is that they're, they were kind of battled behind the scenes and Friedkin said, I'm not making a commercial for the Catholic Church here, right? And <laughs> they ended up, Friedkin mostly won this battle. Yeah. But then in 2000, they re-released it and he recut it doing all of Blatty's changes, explaining away why they did it. And it wasn't as good. It's not as good. And now you've talked to Friedkin and isn't he sort of become more religious? Yeah, I mean, Friedkin, I end the book on that. Friedkin, has, it's a very fascinating relationship because it's almost, he has developed, a, he's sort of, 
It's almost like Blatty lost the battle but won the war. Uh, Freakin, who was a secular Jew from Chicago, who's an out Catholic. <laughs> now he believes in the demons. He believes that they're, oh, he, you know, he, he, uh, he's, he's been a convert. Oh. Uh, uh, so I just want to wrap, wrap it up. I got to ask you, of this list of great movies, what movie still scares you? You looked at them all. What movie do you watch? And you it's a good question because it's hard to be scared by a movie you've seen several exactly, times. Exactly. Uh, I think the the one movie that I uh, always gets me is Texas Chainsaw Massacre, um, really? which is um, it's not because it, it it doesn't scare me as much as the first time I saw it, right. but it's better every time I see it. It's a much more complicated movie than it first uh, appears, and the dynamic of the family of cannibals. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the scene, they they turns out they're actually they seem more like a, my family or your family than you think. They're the more not, you the more you, look the more at the you watch it, you're like that reminds me of a few dinners I've had. Uh, <laughs> the book is called Shock. Value, how a few eccentric outsiders gave us nightmares, conquered Hollywood, and invented modern horror by our good friend Jason Zinneman, who's also a drama critic for the New York Times. And this book is available on Kindle. It's available on iBooks as well as your local. And the old store. fashioned kind of thing that I still use an actual <laughs> book from Penguin. Jason, thanks a lot. Good discussion. Thanks so much. Thank you. Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night.